This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and it's SmackDown time again. Several of you have asked about how to choose between the new Dell XPS 15 with Infinity Display, which means the almost no bezel display, and the Asus ZenBook Pro UX501. Both of these are quad-core machines with NVIDIA GTX 960M graphics. Very similar specs, significantly different prices. So, uh-huh. So, okay, you don't have to watch this. If price is the most important thing to you, even given perhaps some of the shortcomings, shall we say, of the ASUS, it's $500 cheaper for the similar setup. So go ahead and get the ASUS. It's cheaper. But if other things matter to you, um, software that's on there, various things like that, display quality, then keep watching and see what the difference in prices are. And also keep in mind with the Dell XPS 15, there are a variety of configurations. With the ZenBook Pro UX 501, at least in the United States, it's pretty much just one configuration. So with the Dell, you can actually get cheaper if you want, if you're willing to give up on some specs, particularly going with the 1080p display instead of the 4K. So we're going to compare them now. So here we have two 15.6 inch laptops that are pro apps slash gaming laptops, not hardcore gaming laptops. We're not talking like Asus Rogue or something like that or a MSI Dominator, but you know what I mean. Something you can still carry around, but has enough graphics oomph to actually play current games on medium and high settings at 1080p resolution. This is the ASUS ZenBook Pro UX501 that ASUS recently refreshed to bring it up to the Skylake generation CPUs. When we originally reviewed it, it had the fourth generation Haswell inside. NVIDIA GTX 960M, regardless of which generation. And this is the new Dell XPS Infinity, also with the GTX 960M, both available with the Intel Core i7-67H. Q, quad core 45 watt CPU. These are quad core machines, powerhouses, but they're very thin and light, relatively speaking. Now, the Dell is the lighter one, around four and a half pounds. The ASUS is five pounds, which is still darn lightweight, honestly, but then there is a difference in the weight. Obviously, there's a difference in the looks and the aesthetic here. ASUS was doing their usual silver spun metal lid thing, and we'll show you it right there, which sort of, you know, it's also a little MacBook Pro derivative until you close the lid and you see that ASUS spun look. Dell has their own look, the carbon fiber black interior, and then the kind of understated plain, I think, metal top. It, it's you got all metal construction on both of these, high quality construction, rigid, no sharp edges on either of these. And uh, ASUS does a little bit more with the chamfering, the slight little bits of visual bling. I got the chamfering right here around the edges. Both nice looking machines. Price difference is significant. One thing ASUS has been good at with the ZenBook series is to make something that's premium, but that costs less than a lot of the competition. In this case, the ZenBook Pro UX501 is $1,500. That's the US model where we have the 4K display as our only option. I know in some countries out there, some of you have a 1080p display option. We don't have that here. And of course, that one would cost less. For the Dell, there's more price variability. To get something that is comparably configured, that is with the quad-core i7-6700 HQ CPU inside 16 gigs of DDR4 RAM, 512 gig PCIe NVMe fast SSD drive, that the dedicated graphics, which is pretty much par for the course standard on most of the Dell models, you're looking more like $2,000, so more money here. Now, the Dell starts at $999. That's with the Core i3 and no dedicated graphics. Probably the model that just about nobody is going to buy, honestly. Around $1,300 or so, you can get into the 1080p model. That's the one we're using right here. We've reviewed both models. The 1080p is non-touch and matte. So you can come in, you know, getting closer to the price of this, but you're going to go down in resolution if that really matters to you, and that depends on what you're using it for. If you're doing a lot of Photoshop work, you probably want the higher resolution display. If you're mostly gaming and doing Word and streaming video, then the 1080p is fine. So the Dell is not impossible to configure around 1500 bucks. You're gonna get a smaller SSD for the price, so you might end up getting eight gigs of RAM. Of course, both of these are upgradable. They have two RAM slots. You can put your own RAM inside to upgrade them. They both have M2 SSD slots, PCIe, NVMe, fast storage inside. Neither of these has a two and a half inch drive bay. With the Dell, that gets more complicated. If you get the smaller battery in the Dell, you can get a two and a half inch drive bay if you also want to have that. Both of these have dual band Wi-Fi 802.11ac and Bluetooth. So you're looking at a lot of the same stuff here. So, well, what's the difference? First of all, there's the aesthetics. Which of these do you like the look of? Better because looks do count. People really care about how their machines look. They're both well-made. They're both very rigid. They're very solid. You wouldn't want to drop these on your toe. Trust me. 
Ah, that would hurt. Underside of the delt is silver. Lots of vents going on there. Service tag hidden under the XPS door. That's what they do to keep it kind of clean looking. The Asus is a giant Zen book, basically. If you, you've seen the 13 inch models, this is just a bigger one. Brushed aluminum on the bottom. Notice there's no vents over here. These are the speaker grills right there. So for those of you who worry, like to use them on your lap and worry about blocking the vents, this uses the rear exhaust system under the hinge, sort of like the, you know, the MacBook Pros do. And it actually works pretty well. They're about equally as hot and loud when doing something like gaming, which is one of the ways to heat up a laptop quickly. Neither of these gets burning hot. Neither of these gets incredibly loud, but you will hear them when you game. With both of these, nominally they're sealed, but you can unscrew the bottoms. We've got little screws right there, and you can access those internals as I mentioned. Now for ports, ASUS really didn't change anything going from the first gen to the second gen of this, that is from the Haswell to the Skylake generation. They, they, they kept the ports the same. So we have very traditional stuff here. So this is handy if you have a lot of peripherals right now. SD card slot, no brainer, of course, we got that right there. We got our combo mic headphone jack. We got our USB 3.0 ports, standard normal USB 3.0 ports. We have another USB 3.0 port. We have HDMI. We have a mini display port, and that also does Thunderbolt, which is kind of cool. There's in Windows land, there's not a whole lot of Thunderbolt peripherals, but it does give you some versatility. And yes, I tried it with the Apple Thunderbolt display. It does work. Now Dell is the looking forward one. And for this, you're probably going to need some new accessories that you didn't already own. We have HDMI, so we have that. It's HDMI 1.4. So those of you who want 4K displays at 60 frames per second are going to have to use the USB-C port, the new USB-C port right there. And Dell does sell a little portable port adapter thingy for about 75 bucks. It does give you HDMI 2.0 out for those of you who do want 4K at 60 hertz. USB normal 3.0 combo headphone jack once again. So no mini display port here. Big difference. Another USB 3.0 port, SD card slot. So traditional ports and more USB ports. Actually, the ASUS wins. If you want that USB-C, though, which can be a very versatile port, can handle display out, can even handle charging in, though I don't see a monster benefit to that other than maybe a giant portable battery pack doing that sort of thing. And of course, it does hard drives in it all sorts of other USB interface thingies. It's up to you as to which you find more useful in this case. Probably two years down the road, you might be voting for the USB-C, but it's hard to say. So horsepower, we have equivalents here in terms of CPU and GPU and heat, and in terms of thermal throttling, neither of these has really a problem with thermal throttling. Display, another important point. Obviously, the XPS with Infinity Display has that near bezel-less design that looks pretty cool. This one is the 1080p model, non-touch, but also matte, non-glare, pretty nice stuff. Dell's using sharp IGSO panels, whether you go with the 4K or the 1080p model there. And the 4K model for this, is a really lovely display with very high color gamut, high Adobe RGB color gamut. So for graphics professionals, video professionals, that could be pretty compelling. The only challenging thing about the 4K display is it has a very high white point. It is a lot too cool, and that's something that's hard to adjust. It's the nature of the display. Laptops aren't like external monitors where you can choose various white point settings. So it gets dinged a little bit there. Bright displays as well. And the 4K version of this is touch and is glossy. So you would be on parity with the ASUS right there, which is 4K, which is glossy, which is touch. It's also quite bright panel, almost 300 nits. That's using a Samsung PLS panel. And it has a little bit of what I call the SpongeBob problem. SpongeBob, when you're not plugged into like AC, looks a little bit dirty yellow, a little greenish yellow. That's the nature of the Samsung PLS panel. Also, the measurable contrast, because this is a dynamic display and contrast is dynamic on that, is a bit lower. But honestly, in practice, it looks pretty good. The ASUS is pretty color calibratable to be something pretty accurate in terms of sRGB. And it does uh, full sRGB. It does not have high color gamut to cover a very wide Adobe RGB color gamut. So, it's a little bit of a canoodle there as to which to go for. I think the IGSO is more striking. I think the, the Dell really does win in terms of higher contrast, better color saturation, and you have both a 4K and the 1080p, the matte or the glossy option there. So there you have it. ASUS isn't going with the top of the line PLS panel either because honestly at 1500 bucks making something like this, they got to cut some corners and that's a pretty small corner to cut. They're still using a decent PLS display.
trackpads. The Dell, and for those of you who watched and read our review of the XPS 15 Note, awesome trackpad on the Dell. Very nice, like MacBook Pro level. Pleasant to use. Very predictable for tracking. Two finger for right click. That works just fine too. It's a good trackpad. The ASUS trackpad is an okay trackpad. I don't know what it is about ASUS, but you know, even when they have a pretty good trackpad, even if they're using something like from Synaptics, their drivers are always just a little bit weird. You might actually have better luck if you delete their trackpad drivers and just try some generic trackpad drivers. It's not the worst I've used. It's, it's better actually than the Lenovo IdeaPad Y700 trackpad we recently reviewed, but not as good as the Dell. Keyboards. The Dell has lo relatively low key travel for a 15-inch machine. It's about 1.3 millimeter, which is pretty much like the XPS 13 as well. But it's a very nice, well-damped, tactile keyboard. Certainly no flex or anything like that. Both of these have backlighting. Aesthetically speaking, it's up to you whether you like the black carbon fiber soft touch interior here in the black keys or if you like the, the silvery ASUS look. The ASUS keyboard also is pretty low key travel and it's not as pleasingly tactile. It's not as good a keyboard, honestly, in terms of just the overall typing experience. You do get a number pad though, which is a nod to the gamers and the number crunchers out there. But one thing that is kind of annoying is the fact that there is no real separation between the number pad area and the keyboard area. You'll get used to it, not the end of the world, but usually, you know, it's set off a little bit. But they didn't have that much room to work with here, and they really wanted to give you the number pad. Weird thing that ASUS did, why they did this, I don't know, but the, the trackpad, it is not dead center underneath the space bar. So that's going to throw you off when you type until you get used to it. In fact, it's not dead center of the machine either. I'm, it's offset somewhat to that side, but just kind of weird there. So, I mean, that's not a cost-cutting measure. That's just ASUS being a little bit weird. How about speakers? We gave Dell kind of a hard time for the speakers because mostly they kind of sounded distorted. It was loud but distorted, but that was mostly uh, the software settings for the EQ. You could twiddle it around and get it kind of good. So we're going to test out the speakers here. Bang & Olufsen is the audio that ASUS likes to use, and it often sounds anemic in terms of speaker output. Headphones not bad, and both of these headphones are pretty good. But also notice the difference in the color temperatures. And we have the 1080p model, which isn't as cool as the 4K, but you can still see how much bluer or blue-white the background is here. It should be more new neutral like the ASUS. So the ASUS actually gains some points along with that Samsung PLS panel. I'm going to put my microphone right between these two so you can hear the speakers for yourself. First, the ASUS. Both of these are set to 60% volume. Tinny! Oh, Tinny. Oh, gee. This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and here's one that you've been asking for, the Lenovo. Okie dokie. So that's tinny. And now we're going to do the same thing on the Dell. Oh snap, that's a lot better, right? This is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and here's one that you've been asking for, the Lenovo Y700. This is the latest set of Y. So for those of you who care about speaker audio, the Dell would actually win here. Like I said, you've got to fiddle with the settings some to not use the default EQ that, that creates some distortion there. And then at least it's fairly full and loud. We talked a little bit about the, f the the weight difference. The ASUS is about a half a pound heavier. There's a footprint difference because Dell with their XPS 13 and XPS 15 have made the laptops really quite small. So Dell claims it's about the size of a 14-inch laptop. You can see the size difference right there. So you're you're paying for that miniaturization, miniaturization that Dell has achieved there. But how about battery life? You think the little guy is going to suffer in terms of battery life, right? Well, you know, not so much. Actually, with the Dell, it depends if you get the 1080p or the 4K display. In terms of battery life, we managed about six and a half hours doing productivity work, playing some streaming video with the 4K models, and we averaged about eight with the 1080p model. Again, that's light workload brightness set to no more than 40%, which is adequate because these are very bright displays. So that's pretty good battery life for a quad-core powerhouse with switchable dedicated graphics. Both of these do have Intel HD 530 graphics, so they can switch to integrated graphics if they're not working too hard. Now our ASUS here, room for plenty of battery, and it does have an ample battery inside. Battery life's not its strong point. It's at about four and a half hours. So 
if that's important to you, if you've got to be away from an outlet for long periods of time, unplugged, in similar test scenarios, similar brightness settings, it does not run as long on a charge. In part, I think it's because IGZO is a very power frugal display technology. Uh, any drawbacks to IGZO other than the, the cool color temperature, particularly on the 4K panel? The other one is some of you have noticed this and it really must depend on the game you're playing because we demoed it with Battlefield and some others on the on on air and it wasn't really ghosting, but some folks see ghosting, particularly on the 1080p model when they're playing games. That does not happen at all on the ASUS. So there you have it. You know, there, there's no clear cut winner. One other thing I will mention is ASUS puts too much crap on their computers. They're not as bad as Lenovo and HP who really shovel it on there sometimes. But some of their own utilities, like their ASUS cloud storage and stuff like that, just delete them. I found that it was kind of flaky, this guy. We've had one of these long term in. And the more I cleaned it up, you know, I was just about tempted to install Windows 10 clean and straight and, you know, avoid anything I could. I don't know if you really have to go that far though, but delete any piece of ASUS software that you don't need, anything else that they bundle, and this will start to run really nice and smooth. So this needs a little more TLC out of the box just to clean it up. Dell has been doing really clean software builds. I mean, there's the Microsoft Signature Edition if you get it from a Microsoft store. Actually, that removes some useful Dell utilities like the Dell Color Utility and stuff like that. I, I like the way Dell ships it. Pretty much, you have a Dropbox app pre-installed and just the Dell drivers and Dell update, nothing else. Good to go out of the box. Less maintenance there in terms of software and getting it working the way you want. So there you have it. Dell XPS 15 versus Asus ZenBook Pro UX 501. If money is no object, and you know, there are not many of us that can say that, but still, but if you if you can't afford the extra money and you want to go the extra mile in terms of the quality and the better software that's on there, the Dell XPS 15 certainly brings that in spades. It brings the new USB-C port. It is a bit lighter. I mean, four and a half pounds versus five pounds. It, it, they're still both fairly light. With the ZenBook Pro, you'd still get a pretty styling machine. Keyboard, not so much. Display is pretty decent, honestly, and it is 4K resolution. You get a lot of bang for your buck there, and after you clean up the software a whole lot, well, it's a pretty good machine then. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Be sure to watch our video reviews of both of these products. Read our written reviews, and you can ask questions in our Discus forum on each of these reviews, and hit the like button.